Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. This week's episode of Garden DC, we're joined by Kim Ironman. She's the founder of Eco Beneficial LLC, and she, her book is The Pollinator Victory Garden Winning the War on Pollinator Decline with Ecological Gardening. Welcome, Kim. Oh, thanks so much, Kathy. Glad to be here. Good to have you on this wintry week here in the Mid Atlantic. And we're due in for more snow. How about you? Yeah, we're going to get, it sounds like about six to 10 inches. And uh, that's so great for the garden. So I'm, I'm not uh, displeased about that at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a nice fluffy layer on top yeah, of everything else. Yeah. And can you describe exactly where you're calling in from? Uh, yes, I am in Westchester County, New York, um, which is just north of the Manhattan. And so I tell folks I am 16 miles north of Grand Central Station. I'm in a congested suburban area. And so if I can have a pollinator victory garden in my landscape, so can you. Yeah, it's a great example. And for many of us in urban areas where 16 miles actually turns out to be an hour and a half commute, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. not, not 16 minutes. Um, it's even more important to, to have those pollinator habitats uh, squeezed in there. And the reason we're talking to you this week on Garden DC is because you are one of the featured speakers at the Greenscapes Symposium mm -hmm. uh, hosted by Brookside Gardens um, that took place on Friday, February 19th. And you are joined on the speaker roster by Doug Tallamy, Claudio Vasquez of Izel Plants, Emily McCoy, uh, landscape architect. Looks like, you know, such a great program. And you got to talk about the pollinator part. Yes. And following Doug Tallamy. And that is no small task. <laughs> yes. I was going to say, that's the most intimidating time slot of the day, I'm sure. <laughs> but at least, at least they were awake. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And then they're, and they're so receptive at that point after Doug has primed them up, mm -hmm. um, then you get to kind of hit it out of the park with your, <laughs> with your section. Uh, do you, are you often on um, conference slates with Doug? Um, occasionally, of course, this past year, um, we had a few that were canceled, <laughs> so it's a moving target, but, um, you know, I speak at a lot of conferences. Um, I do a lot of teaching. I teach at New York Botanical Garden, Brooklyn Botanic Garden, and the Native Plant Center, and Rutgers Home Garden School, but I do a lot of speaking to small groups, medium-sized groups, huge groups, um, both to new gardens, seasoned gardens, and professionals. Hmm. And I saw that you also speak at Mount Cuba. Uh, yeah, occasionally I do. It's, you know, um, the pandemic is a strange thing because now I'm speaking in a lot of places that I didn't used to be able to get to easily. <laughs> and so um, I, I just spoke at uh, the International Society of Arboriculture, their annual conference uh, that would have been in Arizona. And I have to tell you, I kind of miss going to Arizona. Um, but, um, you know, with, uh, with this wonderful world of virtual speaking and teaching, um, just getting much more of an outreach, which is really fun. And with the snowstorm coming, oh, yeah. it, it kind yeah. of relieves you Double of the, yeah. yeah, exactly. Not going anywhere. <laughs> exactly. So that would have been tough coming back from Arizona and then speaking mm -hmm. here at Brookside Gardens and, and Silver Spring, Maryland. So <laughs> that, that kind of is a silver lining in there. Um, but it, you do miss the in-person part. And I was going to ask you to compare um, some of the audiences. So Greenscape's audiences includes professionals and home gardeners, but then at other conferences, you might just be addressing home gardeners and, and or one might be all professionals. Do you uh, change up and how do you change for those audiences? You know, it, it is tricky. I, I must say, and um, the pandemic and our virtual speaking has made this even more complicated because you kind of have to assume that you may have 
a lot of different levels of knowledge in an audience. So for example, speaking to arborists, you have no clue at an annual conference with you know, thousands of people attending how many know a darn thing about pollinators or native plants or anything. So I just, I just try to take a medium approach and my, um, my general approach is to be, you know, fairly anecdotal and informative. And, and since I do a lot of teaching, you know, um, that's, um, that's the way that I usually approach it. And I just assume that somebody's going to get something out of this presentation, no matter what, you know, no matter what your level, hopefully I've given you something that's going to be useful. Yeah, that's very true. And that, um, even professionals don't know everything. You can't assume. <laughs> no, I cannot tell you how many times I've uh, been hired by an organization like a botanical society, et cetera. And, they, and they'll tell me, you know, our members know so much. They're really experienced and really knowledgeable. So, you know, you got to really be high level with them. And it, invariably, it, it's not quite that. <laughs> I, I must say, invariably. So, um, yeah, there are a lot of really smart people gardening. Um, but I think, you know, we tend to have our little niches where we may be expert. Like if you ask me to talk about vegetable gardening, it would be a very dull interview. <laughs> that is something I don't know about. But um, we all have our little niches that we're quite expert in, I guess. And and so um, can always can always learn. I always learn. I learn. I think uh, the world of Zoom is wonderful because I'm able also to participate and listen to uh, some interesting speakers that I might not be able to hear otherwise, too. Mm -hmm. And then there's the other interactive features like being able to post a poll mm -hmm. or ask people in yeah. the chat where in person you could ask people to raise their hand and say, mm -hmm. how many people currently have a pollinator garden and right. get that right. gauge? Yeah. I do miss the the personal interaction, um, but, you know, we're very fortunate that we have this as an option. So how did you start on the journey, Kim? Were you born just with chlorophyll in your veins and <laughs> jumped up and, and planted a row of pansies, or how did it happen? So I grew up um, in Maryland, in fact, in Timonium, Maryland, home of the state fair, um, not far from D.C., and um, my mother's gardening was not that great. <laughs> My mother would grow basil in a pot. She'd grow maybe an occasional tomato in a planter, a tomato plant. Um, she had a couple peonies and um, this hard plant that she was always battling. I think she spent more time pruning this back than doing anything else in the garden. That was pyracantha. I hated that plant. <laughs> and, um, and so I had absolutely zero influence um, from um, my family uh, relative to gardening. But I was a nature freak from the time when I was a little kid. I just loved, love, love nature. And so as a teenager, I was the one that was going to Outward Bound and going to National Outdoor Leadership School and just immersing myself in it. And so um, I'm also kind of a city girl, right? So when I graduated from college, I moved to New York City and spent uh, quite, quite a while there. So I've got... Uh, I've got a couple different uh, personalities going on, so to speak, uh, things that um, interest me. But living in the city was frustrating because I, I, the only time I could have any contact with nature is when I got out of the city. And so I moved to Westchester County um, many years ago and um, got my little piece of suburban uh, you know, uh, wonder here with things that grow in the ground. <laughs> And uh, I started to take classes at the New York Botanical Garden, which was only seven miles away. And uh, that connection that I had with nature then kind of translated into my passion for landscaping. So that's how it happened. And then what made you aware first about the pollinator decline? Like what was your first uh, encounter with that? Well, you know, I think like most of us, you know, it really started with the um, the collapse of honeybee populations, right? Because I don't think most of us really had heard very much about insect decline before that. Now, there certainly was research going on in Europe and, you know, some other areas of, of the world, but um, primarily in Europe. But um, the, the crashing populations of honeybees, which of course are not native to North America, but been here for 400 years. They were brought in in 1622 to Jamestown, Virginia, along with things like 
peacocks and bull mastiffs and lots of European weeds. <laughs> and, um, you know, they've been here a while and um, they've, they were kind of the focused focus, excuse me, um, you know, uh, of uh, agricultural extensions in terms of providing information and support on uh, honeybee management because they're, you know, very good generalist pollinators. And so when those populations started to crash, um, you know, I started paying a lot of attention to that and um, wondered, well, what's happening with our own native pollinators? And uh, one piece of information led to another and realized that there was um, a real lack of uh, robust information about um, the crashing of, for example, native bee populations, that a lot of the studies were quite old and, um, and not very robust. And that's changed. That's changed dramatically. But then you start thinking, well, you know, when I was a kid, I, you know, I remember going out on a warm summer night, a humid evening, and you'd go out for a drive uh, with your folks and you'd have insect splatter all over your windscreen on your car, right? That doesn't happen the way that it used to. It just doesn't happen anymore. So something is going on. It's it's beyond pollinator loss. It's about you know insect decline. Um, and then if you think about it, it's not only insects. It's uh, it's uh, vertebrates uh, and in, invertebrates, um, bird decline, and so on and so on. Species loss is is absolutely uh, extraordinary, both with uh, vertebrate and invertebrate species. And um, anybody that's listening, I really invite you to, to look at the uh, website of the IUCN and take a look and see that scary data. You know, you'll start thinking a little bit differently about what you can do in your landscape and how important it is when you realize how many species are at risk. And that's IUCN. What does mm-hmm. that stand for? International Union of, uh, let's see, International Conservation. I think that's it. I, I always call it IUCN. No, I'm going to have to look it up. Okay. <laughs> uh, International International Union for Conservation of Nature. Ah, okay. IUCN.org. So they're kind of like the, um, they're the gold standard for um, uh, measuring species loss. And, you know, even they will admit that they don't monitor every species. They only monitor a small fraction because there's so many species on Earth. Yeah, I don't know how you would be able to yeah. count everything yeah. since there's still species being discovered uh, all around us. Yes. So previously on the podcast, we've talked about home beekeeping, obviously the honeybees, uh, the non-native ones that we talked about, and butterfly gardening um, from the Smithsonian Gardens. And we focus particularly on monarch habitats. But you have a much broader uh, emphasis on pollinators. Can you talk about some of those other categories? Sure. So, you know, animal pollinators are the ones that we think of when we think about pollination services. Um, Obviously, a lot of plants are wind pollinated. Some plants are water pollinated. Um, I either, you know, seed is dispensed um, uh, via water. But um, our animal pollinators include the obvious, like bees, but there are others, you know, that maybe we don't think about all the time um, in our landscape. So there are beetles that are pollinators. They primarily are pollen eaters. They also, a lot of them like to eat uh, flower parts. And um, of course, we have butterflies, which we've thought of as perhaps inefficient pollinators, but I'm going to make a comment about that in a minute. And even moths can be very good pollinators. Some moths don't eat as adults, like our silk moths don't eat anything um, when they're adults, uh, which is kind of fascinating, but many moths do. Um, We have some species of flies that are pollinators. And um, we've got, even in the uh, Southwest and and, uh, limited part of California, um, pollinating bats. So um, not all of the species within a particular group are pollinators, but you know many many are, and um, you know it's it's a wild world out there. You know, in some places uh, in the world, even marsupials can be pollinators. It's it's kind of funny, but primarily, you know, in our own landscapes, um, we're thinking about insects, and then of course birds and. You know, we think of hummingbirds uh, primarily, but there are over 50 species of birds in North America that that feed on nectar. So there are quite a few that we can support in our landscapes. So um, let me just make a comment about butterflies, right? Because I heard that wonderful interview about uh, the butterfly gardening. It was really great. And, um, you know, we've kind of dismissed butterflies historically as not very important pollinators and not very effective pollinators. And... um, as a person who's focused on the environment and, and using native plants to improve the environment, 
you know, I'm, I'm always thinking about evolutionary connections and what we might not know that we just haven't learned yet by observing mother nature. So just, um, I think it's less than five years ago, there was a study that came out of North Carolina state, um, observing the swallowtail butterflies and they're nectaring on a plant, flame azalea, rhododendron calendulaceum. And um, they found in this study that um, swallowtail butterflies nectared, they foraged a little bit differently than other butterflies. What they do is they flap their wings, swallowtail butterflies, while they're, uh, while they're nectaring. And they, that's called wing pollination. And while they're feeding and they're flapping their wings, they're releasing pollen, which gets on their wings, and they go on to the next flower and on to the next plant. Turns out that they're the most efficient pollinators of that particular plant, rhododendron calendulaceum flame azalea. So I'm, I was very humbled by that information. And it makes me think that there's so many other of these evolutionary connections we just don't know about yet. So we can never take a pollinator for granted. So it might be doing a very important job. So true. And so the name of your book, The Pollinator Victory Garden. So when we hear the term victory garden, we think of something very specific, you know, World War yes. One or Two uh, vegetable garden. So how do you come up with the name and what what is a pollinator victory garden? So, you know, um, I came up with this concept uh, quite a few uh, years ago, pre-pandemic. <laughs> so I guess I was kind of lucky in terms of the timing of the book. Um, but, you know, in World War One and World War Two, I think there were over 20 million um, American households that created um, gardens for food defense, you know, essentially as a way to help the war. It was kind of a marketing effort, really, um, as I understand it. I don't, I don't think it, you know, it was the difference between people starving and not, but it was a way to get people involved, participate in the war effort, do what they could if they couldn't go to war and fight themselves, you know. And, um, and so I thought that was... Um, you know, a, re a really pretty significant uh, movement. I thought, well, we need that for pollinators. You know, we need to have a similar movement for pollinators where it's top of mind for all of us in terms of what we can do and each of us can participate. And so, you know, a pollinator victory garden is really a garden that um, has certain attributes that um, make it a best practice approach, right? So first of all, you know, when we think of pollinators, we think of flowers and we don't always think about where pollinators live. We think about what they eat. So habitat, including the appropriate habitat for different species of pollinators is absolutely essential um, to helping them survive, not just survive, but to thrive. So in the case of our uh, native bees, the vast majority of our native bees are ground nesters. So thinking about including uh, areas in your landscape that are not covered up with mulch or plants, preferably bare areas in full sun with workable, friable soil, is a really great place to accommodate and support ground nesting pollinators. So sometimes it can be a challenge to kind of fabricate that. Um, ground nesting bees may not think that you've chosen the right spot. So really a good way to, to do this is to observe and see where ground nesting bees are already going and make that hallowed ground, make that an area where you're, you are not landscaping, you're not, you know, trampling through, et cetera. And then the um, other uh, percentage, uh, smaller percentage of our native bees are cavity nesters and, and we can help them find the habitat they need in, in a number of different ways. So, for example, uh, keeping some pithy stem plants um, standing, um, hollow stem plants, and maybe cutting off a few of those old Joe pie weeds uh, in the early fall, and maybe some elderberries to create some overwintering habitat for a you know, cavity nesting bee. Um, most of those bees are going to die, of course, before winter sets in, but some will be overwintering and surviving. And um, thinking about other areas where these uh, cavity nesters uh, might be using um, that exist in our landscapes. For example, you might have a stone wall where you've got some um, stones missing and there are some cavities in that stone wall. Perfect place for perhaps some bumblebees or old mouse holes or beetle burrows um, where bees, cavity nesting bees might also use keeping some uh, dead trees or dying trees standing. That sounds like uh, a big ask in small landscapes. I, I understand that. 
But um, if you've got a tree where there's no target, there's no hazard target, um, okay, you're good to go. But if you um, are concerned about a tree coming down, we'll cut it down to a manageable height and let it uh, let it die because the beetles will tunnel through it. And then those beetle tunnels will be used by, by bees. So creating habitat, promoting habitat, encouraging habitat is just as important in a pollinator victory garden as providing floral resources. So that's the first, you know, one of the first best practices. And what would your secondary best practice be? Okay. Oh, where to go with native plants. Okay. If I haven't given myself away yet, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a native plant lady, right? So it's, it's with a reason. And, and trust me, I love plants. I'm a plantaholic. I have a blog post on my website called My Brugmansia. <laughs> a, a native plant geek goes AWOL. Yeah, I love plants. But I do appreciate the fact that... Um, you know, with development, um, which has been so dramatic over the past hundred years, we've lost so much natural ha- natural habitat where um, you know creatures can can live, where we can support wildlife and support our native plants. And so, you know, the Doug Tallamy message: our homes can be refugia, right? They can be um, our landscapes can be places where these creatures, if they fly, they've got a really good chance of getting here and moving into other areas where they um, can be supported as well. But um, we can really do quite a bit in our, our home landscapes. And so um, those evolutionary connections, you know, I've alluded to with the butterfly example, um, aren't always obvious. And um, we, um, you know, we're, we are really in, in good shape if we use mother's na- mother nature's cues, right? So pollinators about, 25% of our native bee species are specialists on particular plant pollen. And so if we know that, then we can start to include some of those specialist plants. And a couple of those I'll mention, and I can't wait for spring. Some of our spring ephemerals, um, plants that emerge before trees leaf out when there's enough moisture and enough sun, and then they die back in the summer. And they're wonderful additions to a woodland or shady garden. So things like Claytonia virginica, right? Little tiny spring ephemeral, charming as can be, easy to tuck into a woodland or shade garden. So that plant has an association with um, a particular mining bee, which is a specialist on that plant. Geranium maculatum or wild geranium, there's another one that's also a specialist plant. And even um, sometimes, even if there's not this very strict evolutionary connection between plant and pollinator, um, pollinators have preferences about plants. So if we... Um, if we think, okay, maybe Mother Nature does know best, <laughs> and maybe if I use native plants that are uh, appropriate to my site and native to my my region, um, then you know I'm going to actually be supporting uh, more of the ecosystem that I want to support. And so, um, native plants—that would be my second tip. Really, um, doesn't have to be a hundred percent. I'd love it if it was, but you know, you can have your indulgences in the landscape. Um, I just received a packet of these fabulous looking poppies <laughs> from Renee's Garden Seeds. I bet you got those too, Kathy. Mm-hmm. Those are and amazing. Like, yeah. Where, where can I put those? Uh, they're going to go in a. They're going to go in a container, you know, on my patio, and I'll have my little non-native indulgence, you know. But they're fabulous. Who doesn't want those? <laughs> so, um, but native plants are, are quite important for those evolutionary connections that I mentioned. Um, and, um, you know, thinking about biodiversity, um, as a gardener or a landscape professional is key, especially in the face of climate change. And so thinking about in a pollinator garden, what I call achieving floral balance, achieving a balance between, uh, diversity, plant diversity and plant sufficiency. So we are having a diverse, Um, array of plants in our landscapes, but we're having enough of any given species. So let me kind of explain that. Diversity really matters because we've got a lot of different pollinators. Like I mentioned, we've got the bees, we've got the beetles, we've got the pollinating flies. Even wasps can be good pollinators. They're not as good as bees because they're not fuzzy like bees are, but you know, hummingbirds and so on and so on. So each group has its preferences in terms of um, suites of plant characteristics. You probably noticed in your own garden, if you've got wonderful red 
flowers that are filled with nectar, like a Monarda didyma, a bee balm, or a Lobelia cardinalis cardinal flower, or Silene virginica, you know, um, that wonderful little red plant. You'll notice the the uh, hummingbirds will find those. They'll, they'll come into your landscape and they'll scout. And they're looking for red because that's their favorite. Now, if they can't find it, yeah, they'll go to a penstemon. <laughs> they'll find another source. But they prefer those red tubular flowers. And so those kinds of preferences and um, and a lot of these are just, you know, evolutionary developments um, exist between plants and pollinators. So we got to have a diverse array of plants to accommodate different types of pollinators. So that's where the diversity comes in. The sufficiency part of floral balance. Well, what's that about? So um, it kind of makes sense, even if you didn't know there was research there. But research out of the University of California uh, Berkeley Bee Lab found that um, a one square meter mass of the same species was an ideal target for a pollinator to find. That tells us, huh, making targets in our landscape is, is not a bad idea, right? This is going to help pollinators find the, uh, the resource. This can be tricky for those of us that don't have big landscapes. It's a lot to ask to have a diverse array of flowering plants and, of course, host plants, too, as well as sufficient targets. So I think we just we compromise on this and we do the best we can. What we don't do is in the spring, we don't go to that native plant sale and buy one perennial at some little itty bitty thing and tuck in the garden and hope that a pollinator is going to find it. We create smaller targets. We buy three or we buy five. We create a large enough grouping so a pollinator's got a fighting chance to, to find it. Or we can think about creating a meadowscape, a meadow-like garden in our landscapes. And this is a very effective uh, tool in deer country. And who doesn't live there? <laughs> there are There's so much deer browse in this uh, country, um, mm-hmm. it's a little scary. So a meadowscape um, can be a very erratic array of flowering uh, plants and grasses, as you would find in a naturally occurring meadow, or it can be more designed. Um, but if you choose the more erratic pattern of plants, um, it becomes less of a deer buffet, right? They don't f- have this easy target. But the cool thing is that uh, pollinators like bees and butterflies have a behavior called floral constancy. And when they go out on each of their foraging missions during the course of a day, they're looking for one species of plant. And so if your meadowscape, say in the spring, has got um, probably one of the earlier blooming plants in a, in a meadow, uh, penstemon, might be a penstemon digitalis, um, a common beard tongue, or it might be penstemon hirsutus, hairy penstemon. I love all the penstemons. They're wonderful plants. Um, that pollinator's going to be able to kind of find those, that repetition of bloom in that meadow and be able to... Um, uh, to utilize that resource. So there are a couple of different ways to do that. Um, so I've, I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, got, I got going, I can tell you the whole book. <laughs> yes. So that was, that was a lot of great information there, especially that square meter clump or yeah. having a larger landscape, but repeated use yeah. of the same plant throughout it. So right. I think that's, you know, probably the toughest part for yeah. personally for me as a plant collector who has onesie twosie oh, plants everywhere yeah, yeah um to learn that lesson that yeah for actual pollinator attraction uh you want to have a good size stand of something or if you're you know in containers or you're dealing with say with the hoa who wants you right. to have all green turf on the front um that you'll have to kind of garden on the edges and, and find some other ways around that and, you know, and that brings me to another point. There is another way to, to, uh, that's a hack, right? Is get to know your neighbors and, and make buddies with them and convince them that they need some native plants to support pollinators too. So um, it took me 26 years living next to one neighbor to get to this place. <laughs> but she now has this wonderful pollinator garden that was installed on Memorial Day this, uh, this past year. And she is thrilled with what is going on in there. So, of course, what I've just done, you know, is increase the resources for the pollinators that are visiting my landscape and them sharing the wealth, you know. So now she gets the uh, wonderful butterflies and the bees and the pollinating flies and the hummingbirds and she couldn't be happier. So this speaks to defragmenting 
habitat. This speaks to creating more connectivity um, from one landscape to another. Now, I don't think it's gotten quite as far down as Washington, D.C. yet, but we have an initiative that started um, a few years ago uh, in Wilton, Connecticut, called the Pollinator Pathway Project. And um, this is just, a, it's a volunteer run um, project, a great website, Pollinator, I think it's pollinator-pathway.org, lots of good resources there. And I'll give a plug for the resources on my website too, ecobeneficial.com. I got a whole section on the Pollinator Victory Garden. So look at those two and you'll learn a lot about, you know, how you can create your own thriving pollinator garden, but also start to defragment habitat and increase resources for pollinators by getting other neighbors involved, getting towns involved, using vacant lots, using church landscapes, using school landscapes, and so on and so on. That's where we are going to make a difference. You know, it takes a village. Remember that saying? Mm -hmm. Well, that's what we can do. Um, and it's not just going to be pollinators, P.S. So there is no such thing as a pollinator victory garden that doesn't support other species because you're going to get other species that uh, benefit from this approach, too. But defragmenting habitat and getting neighbors excited, um, I really enjoy this. I mean, to the credit of um, several of my clients uh, that I've built gardens for, um, they've had me come in and do walk and talks. And we've even had like a plant party with neighbors pre pandemic, um, where I'll, I'll come in, uh, do a little lecture and, um, we get some, some native plugs to hand out for free to the people that show up. These are friends and family members and whatnot of my clients. And then we walk through the garden. We talk about the plants and what they do and what they attract. And everybody goes home with a few plants that they can plant themselves. So, you know, I know this is a tall order with a pandemic, right? But um, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll get past that. We'll get past that. So do, do the kind of sharing that you can do online um, and um, get other people excited. And it really, it's such a fulfilling thing when you've planted a plant and all of a sudden you're seeing creatures that are using that plant that you never saw before. It's, it's totally astounding. Um, and one of my great pleasures in life, getting uh, photos from my clients. They're sending me photos of what they're seeing in their garden. It's just, it's great. It's great. Yeah, it's wonderful advice. And I, and I love the idea of sprinkling the same kind of plant down the block. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it just happens organically, like literally, yes. literally <laughs> receives itself. Right. You know, my penstemon makes it or right. a squirrel digs up a mold and <laughs> moves it down the block. And then there's, you know, the more deliberate where somebody comes along and says, oh, I love that iris. And then you yeah. dig a section and, and share it with them. And I often see, you know, several blocks where I'm like, well, that definitely migrated from one garden to the other. <laughs> Uh, by hand I could see that and then I was going to say I love the idea of sh like you might have a shared driveway or a shared oh, yeah. hill strip or meeting yep. strip and to yep. make that your pollinator victory garden between you and your neighbor um, and that's yeah. often of course where the full sun is right and that's I mean it's a nice way to connect with your neighbors you know um, it, it's you know, it's, it's a meaningful connection. I mean, it, it may sound kind of silly, but it really is a meaningful connection because you're, you're sharing something that's joyful with them. And God, do we need that now? <laughs> and, and who doesn't so, love free here. plants? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, um, a lot of folks are a little wary of straight species natives, certain ones that are prolific reseeders, not all are prolific reseeders, but you know, it's such a minor inconvenience. But what I suggest is you dig those little babies up the, the little volunteers that you didn't plan on or didn't want and just put them in, you know, small pots and, and share it with, with friends, with family, with, you know, the local school, with whoever's got a garden and um, people really enjoy that. One of the ways you can share, of course, is if you're in a garden club, host mm -hmm. a little plant swap or what I've been doing because of the pandemic and you want to have social distancing, of course, is just put some pots out at the end of my driveway with a free, <laughs> a, a free sign and then you just post it to the neighborhood listserv or, or next door or whatever and say yep. day li lilies or whatever it is at the end of the driveway and and they disappear fast they don't last long no. and, and, and in new york you could put a sofa out and it won't last <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and believe me, I've walked by other neighbors and scooped up, you know, plants all along the way too, and come home with uh, pockets full of dirt. <laughs> so yeah. You're like, oh yeah, I forgot I picked up these bulbs on the street. But yeah, that's a great way to to pocket 
a pollinator garden. And, and of course, when you're mentioning school gardens and church gardens and municipal gardens, you can lobby for less turf and oh, more, yeah. more meadow. Um, and when you were talking about pollinator alley type gardens, we do have in the D.C. area um, a great proliferation of stream bed uh, parkways that yeah. make yep. make the connection that way. And, you know, our Rock Creek Park through the city was one of the original ones doing that. Yes. So it yes. created a nice um, avenue there. But of course, you can be more deliberate of, you know, if it's a built neighborhood and right. creating something like that. And so, you know, I, uh, I am not kind to the lawn. <laughs> I call the lawn the green desert. It really is kind of an ecological wasteland. It's, it's a cultural thing. We adopted this, this concept from Europe. But, um, you know, turf lawn, uh, the vast majority of species are not going to be native. You might have, a, you know, a fescue in there or something that's native. But by and large, these are non-native species. And because we keep cutting them and, you know, we mow them and whatever, they, they're not very productive. They also don't have very deep roots. So they're not very good at holding stormwater either. So keep the lawn that you really use. Lose the rest. That's my message. And um, so... What do you what do you do with that? I mean, how do you and and by the way, just letting you know weeds like uh, clover and dandelions appear in your lawn that does not make a meadow, right? That's better than a very sterile lawn, but that's really not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is doing something intentional, right? So I have this uh, talk about this in the book, this concept of creating smaller pollinator islands in your lawn. So it, you know, if your neighbors are concerned. You think you might have a problem with a homeowners association, whatever, if you dig up your whole lawn, you know, start with an island um, and create this wonderful little pollinator paradise in a patch that um, is aesthetically pleasing and um, does the job for pollinators. Think about the edges of your landscape, the, the borders between you and your neighbors. Think about your foundation plantings. There's, there's no written rule that says a foundation planting has to have certain plants or has to be a certain width. Extend that out, create more depth, create those little ecotones, those areas of richness between taller plants and shorter plants, shrubs and herbaceous plants, for example. And um, just, you know, starting to think about your woodland edge if you have one. That's usually a zone that's really abused. They're usually like tall trees, book transition to short grass. There's no kind of layering at all. And that's really um, not a good practice if we're trying to be ecologically supportive. We want to think about those layers from the canopy trees, the sub canopy trees, the shrub layer, the herbaceous layer, et cetera. It's more aesthetically pleasing and it's more ecologically functional. So those are some of the things that you can do. Now, if you're in a neighborhood where everybody, you know, is super neat and tidy and you think, a, you know, a natural looking meadow might not <laughs> fit the bill in your front yard, do it in the backyard. Um, be clever and plant in drifts. Doesn't have to be completely erratic meadow. And one of the easiest targets for conversion is a hillside. All right. Haven't you seen folks trying to mow their hillsides? <laughs> oh, yeah. I've seen people get, a, get out a rope, literally. <laughs> yeah. I mean, really. I mean, there's a better use for that, <laughs> that area. So think about a short meadow or meadowscape. Uh, again, that will be much more ecologically supportive. And, um, you know, think about some plants that are deeply rooted and that will hold the soil, you know, throughout four seasons. Um, so you don't have an erosion problem, but, you know, I think we can lose a lot of turf and not miss much. And speaking of plant selection, so you had mentioned penstemon is one of your favorites. Mm. Um, what are some other great choices for the Mid-Atlantic gardener to start with? All right. So the first thing I, I want to do is to, um, to share with you that I, I never like to suggest that people just look at like one plant list, right? So if you're going to be a good gardener, whether you're doing native gardening or not, you got to know some fundamentals, right? You've got to do a site analysis, even if it's a cursory site analysis and, and make some estimation about the number of hours of full sun uh, during the day, um, the moisture level, what your drainage is like. You, you know, you've got to do a soil test. I, it gets me so upset when I see professionals that are not doing soil tests for clients. 
you know, how can you possibly know that you can grow blueberries if you don't know what your soil pH is? Because a blueberry doesn't want to live in soil that's got a pH that's much higher than 5.5. So getting a good site analysis, um, uh, and there's some wonderful resources you know, for that online, um, is the first step in trying to figure out what's going to grow. And then, then you've got to figure out, okay, what's native to my area and how native are you going to be? Uh, you could be thinking about plants that are native to the Northeast or the Mid-Atlantic. You could be thinking about plants that are native to your state. You could be think thinking about plants that are native to your county. So what's the best practice and the most limiting one? Get as close to where you are as possible in terms of uh, nativity. But that, um, that can be tough because it really does limit plant choices. So I will tell you, uh, I will freely admit that I use a mid-Atlantic plant in many landscapes. <laughs> that is a really good one. Um, Dicentra eximia, a wild bleeding heart that just seems to, you know, flower off and on throughout the entire growing season from April through October. But I'm trying to emphasize plants that are regionally native to the county that I'm in, or at least the state I'm in, and that are appropriate for the site. So having given you that huge caveat, right? Do your research. Don't count on one list. Go online, look at resources like the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center database, right? The native plant database, lots of good information. Uh, you can do searches uh, and filter those searches. Um, take a look at BONAP, B-O-N-A-P.org, the Biota of North America program. And you can look up plant names and see if they're native to where you are. And why, why does that matter? Why, why does it matter that you're choosing a plant that's native to your general region? Well, here's an example. A wonderful plant in the Midwest is Sylphium perfoliatum. I can't talk, Sylphium perfoliatum. And that is cup plant. And uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful plant out in the Midwest, but it's an invasive plant uh, on the list in both New York and Connecticut. So just because a plant is native to the United States doesn't mean it's appropriate for where you are. So, you know, do a little digging. So, you know, there are plants for shade and there are plants for sun. There are plants for dry soil. There are plants for wet soil. Um, there are endless numbers of plants that I think are wonderful. If I'm in early spring in March and I'm wondering, oh my God, are the honeybees and some of our early bumblebees going to survive this year? And when I see red maple, Acer rubrum in bloom, I'm happy. I'm happy because that's a great pollinator plant at that time of year. When I see Salix discolor, you know, pussy willow, any of our native willows that are in bloom early in the season, I'm happy because I know they're doing their job. Uh, when I see, I'm thinking woodies now, you know, wonderful plants like Circus canadensis, you know, um, our native red bod, but I know that, um, you know, that's doing a great job. I'm a huge fan of the spring ephemerals for the reasons I explained. They're so important to many of our early emerging pollinators and ones that are particularly ones that are specialists, but they're, um, they're plants that, um, that I use in, in many landscapes if the conditions are good that I think are particularly great pollinator plants. Again, make sure they're appropriate to where you are. Anis hyssop, Agastache funiculum, is a phenomenal pollinator plant. Mm -hmm. And um, it does matter, um, you know, if you're choosing cultivars, which cultivar you, you choose. I would prefer that you buy straight species when you can find them. But um, not all cultivars function the same way in terms of the amount of nectar, the amount of resources, um, or the color being appropriate for the pollinator in question. That's a really good one. Our Menardas are just wonderful pollinator plants, but for different pollinators. So Menarda didyma, uh, Scarlet Bee Balm, that's going to be great for hummingbirds. Whereas Menarda fistulosa, wild bergamot, is going to be fantastic for some of our bumblebees. And then Menarda punctata, which is uh, known as spotted bee balm or horse mint, is a really funky looking crazy pagoda uh, arrangement of a bloom that attracts a lot of bees and a lot of wasps. Now, if you're a gardener, you know that wasps are good. <laughs> you know you want them as predators uh, and in some cases with some species parasitizers. Um, and they, they do deliver some pollination services too. So, you know, but those, those three Minardas are going to grow in very different kind of situations. Your Minarda dinema is going to like full sun with plenty of moisture or part sun, again, with plenty of moisture. 
I see that growing naturally in Western North Carolina, streamside in the shade. If you do that in most of our landscapes, you're going to get powdery mildew, but that's locally adapted local genotype that's doing that there. Um, and then Menarda bergamot, that's going to be, you know, a plant that's going to be able to take a little bit drier soil, not crazy dry, right? But medium to on the slightly drier side and uh, is where it's going to perform best. And then Monarda punctata, well, that one wants great drainage and it wants, uh, it, it actually really likes sandy soil and uh, it doesn't like a lot of fertility and that'll do really well in that landscape. So, you know, it's, uh, it's tough to name just like one plant because they're all, <laughs> they're all <laughs> wonderful at what they do. Mm-hmm. I am a particular fanatic for Joe pie weeds. I love Joe pie weeds, uh, the Eutrochium species. They've been renamed from Eupatorium just to confuse us all. And they can be a challenge to use in a suburban landscape because they're so darn tall, six feet, seven feet, eight feet, yike. So even though I try to use as much um, as I can with straight species plants, that's a time where I say, hey, better a dwarf Joe Pieweed than no Joe Pieweed at all. So I routinely will use um, little Joe or baby Joe in the landscape because just such a tremendous plant. Yeah, that's a great point because a, a tall, floppy Joe Pieweed is probably not the best choice for an urban garden. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's going to be and, tough. Yeah, and there is a new cultivar called um, Ruby, which um, I'm just trialing. I just got some um, last season um, from a grower that's doing a lot of natives, and it's um, it's only supposed to be 32 inches tall. So we'll see. But see, the the question is, how good of a plant is it in terms of ecological juice, right? Um, I have found out the hard way, as so many of us have, that some of these dwarf cultivars are just dogs. They're just dogs. They don't flower well. They don't um, produce much fruit. You know, some of the, um, the dwarf viburnums, for example, are mm, not good plants. And so, you know, that's a question to ask. And there, there are lots of, um, there's lots of native washing going on now, guys. Let's be honest, right? Everybody is jumping on the native bandwagon. I was trying to pound the drum 20 years ago and nobody was listening. <laughs> and here we are. Everybody's jumping on the native bandwagon. But, mm-hmm. you know, use your, your brain cells and say, you know, if this plant looks completely different than what I'm used to seeing, you know, is it performing well? And maybe buy one and trial it and see. That's what I do for clients. Before I'm putting these things out in people's gardens, I'm trying them out and seeing if they're garden worthy and whether they have an ecological function. So okay. here's here's an example, Bol- Boltonia asteroides, false aster, fabulous plant, late summer bloom, likes moist soil, likes sun, beautiful plant. It's a little leggy. So there's a naturally occurring uh, form, Nana, and uh, so I picked some of those up and, you know, it's only like, I don't know, a couple feet tall. Perfect. And I thought, okay, we'll see. Well, just loaded, just loaded with pollinators. So for small landscapes or container gardening, and that's a, that's a topic that I speak about and I teach about um, using uh, native plants in containers. So that, that's just a great choice. So, you know, there, there are always exceptions. There are always compromises that we can make and the realities that we have to deal with in our landscapes. Yeah, and it, there's also, of course, your own personal resources and what you can get. And we're so lucky in the D.C. area to be not too far away from Mount Cuba up the oh, road, yeah. which we mentioned yep. earlier. Yep. And they've been doing some phenomenal native versus cultivar trials side right. by side. So you right. can go out there and, and look in person and also read their research online and yeah. see, you know, that Phlox Gina is a cultivar that's actually outperforming the straight species but you know there's a place for all of it in your garden so it's great to know did you see that page in my book kathy Well, well, and I, yes, and I visited <laughs> myself to, to check some of those out and take photos so, because it's yeah. amazing. So let me let me just talk about that a little bit. And so that's the conundrum. So um, for years, Mount Cuba was doing these plant trials. I've got a, an interview from years ago with uh, Greg Tepper on um, on some of their plant trials. And um, they were focused on garden worthiness for many, many years until they got a hold of Doug Tallamy. <laughs> Right. And so things have changed quite a bit over the years at at, at Mount Cuba. But I remember Greg telling me, and he was a horticulturist at that time overseeing these trials, um, that there, I think it was their 2009 coneflower report, Echinacea report. Most of those plants that they trialed were no longer for sale because they're such 
crappy plants, excuse my French. Um, by the way, they've just come out with another coneflower report, which everybody should take a look at. Okay. So, um, so things have changed, fortunately. And in that report, you'll see the pollinator activity on the, you know, on the different cultivars. So here's the thing. One of the reasons that I am emphasizing straight species plants is for that genetic diversity that comes from that seed, particularly of local ecotypes being so important, right? But we've got the genetic diversity with straight species plants. The truth of the matter is the vast majority of cultivars, aka native ours, the vast majority of them are propagated asexually, okay? They're tissue culture, they're cuttings, they're whatever they are, but they, um, they're clones, they're all genetically the same. So, hmm, let's think about that. Has that ever gotten us into trouble? Think Irish potato famine, perhaps, <laughs> in terms of being reliant upon, you know, one particular type of plant that is all the same. Um, so I love Gina, and, and so I split the difference with clients. So I'll use some Gina because it attracts way more pollinators than virtually any flocks, including the straight species, but I also try to get the straight species in the garden. And, um, and, you know, I run the risk of hybridizing, uh, you know, and so distance can be helpful with that, um, kind of keeping them separate, but we need more uh, native straight species plants if we're going to keep the earth going and we need fewer cultivars. And that's tough because, you know, when you go shopping for native plants, sometimes the only thing you can find are native cultivars. But if we ask and we talk to vendors and um, we make a request known, we're going to have better choices. It's, it's happening. It's happening now. Yeah, and I think if you grow from seed that's collected, you know, from another person's garden, uh, that might be also another way. And there are also naturally accru occurring cultivars and selections as well. Yes, there, there are. There are. But typically that's not what you're going to find for mm -hmm. sale. You Correct. Know? Yeah, this has been so educational and inspiring. Uh, we have to get out and get some springtime so we can plant some of these <laughs> natives and get that snow to melt off our spring ephemerals, which will be coming up in a few weeks. Um, can you tell our listeners again how they can contact you and get more information on your book as well? Sure. So I invite you to visit my website, which is ecobeneficial.com, just as it sounds, and uh, just loaded with information, including lots of information on uh, the Pollinator Victory Garden. Um, feel free to contact me on my contact form there. I, I love getting questions from folks. Appreciate that. And um, as far as the book is concerned, you invite anywhere, um, you know, books are sold, as they say. But here's my request to you. It, I would love it. I would love it if you buy two copies, okay? Buy one on Amazon, fine. But go ahead and find your independent bookseller who's really struggling right now, okay? It had a really, really rough year. And make sure you put in an order with them, too, because they need our support. Thank you again, Kim. And I am going to be planting even more penstemon than I have currently <laughs> so I can make that meter size area, <laughs> that solid area, because I feel like I have a lot of penstemon, but not quite to that size. Well, thank you so much, Kathy. Really appreciate uh, you having me today. Plant Profile, Winter Jasmine. Winter Jasmine, Jasminum nudiflorum, blooms in mid to late winter in the mid-Atlantic region. You will see them flowering in front yards, cascading over retaining walls and down the sides of steps. My favorite use of them is in the concrete containers that line the National Mall in Washington, D.C. The plant itself is classified as a deciduous perennial though most consider it a shrub, and it can be trained as a vine as well. The weeping habit of winter jasmine is really quite lovely. Try a winter jasmine trained on an arbor or trellis. It also makes a good ground cover, especially on a slope or hillside. If planted in the ground, it can sucker and spread, but it is easily pulled up and potted up to share. It thrives in a variety of growing situations, from full to part sun, from wet to dry soils, I have never had to water mine even in the hottest of summers. They are pollution tolerant and are generally not troubled by pests. 
It is often mistaken for forsythia, but there are several differences. The winter jasmine stems are squarish, flexible, and deep green, while the forsythia stems are round, brittle, and brown. Also, the winter jasmine blooms are a lighter yellow and a little smaller than forsythia. Finally, forsythia's normal bloom time is later, in mid-March here in our area. Winter jasmine is one of those carefree background plants that shines in the worst of the gray winter season. It deserves a spot in your garden. Support the garden media before it's gone. What happened to the G in HGTV? Where did all the garden stories in my local newspaper disappear to? How did the garden section of my local bookstore shrink to just half a shelf? You know that your daily newspapers and local community weeklies are shrinking, but have you ever pondered why one section in particular, sports, never seems to shrink? It's not because it has the most advertising support, nor does it have the broadest appeal. What it does have is a rabid readership base. And when I say rabid, I mean that not only do readers follow every story, both online and in the paper, but they engage with that content. They post comments and go back and read what others write, then comment again. They tweet out links and pass them along on Facebook. They are voracious for any tiny little scrap of new information about their favorite teams and player. Why doesn't gardening have that same kind of enthusiastic ban- fan base? Well, actually it does. Gardening is by far the most popular pastime in the USA, and we added another 16 or so million gardeners just last year. Alas, though, it's also a primarily solitary pursuit, with each of us in our own garden puttering and weeding in our own little world. Some join garden clubs or volunteer at local public gardens, sure, but the vast majority do not. They may read the garden column in their local daily and nod in agreement or chuckle in amusement, but rarely does it move them to action. Even the touchy subjects of deer and native plants barely get a rise out of even the most passionate home gardener. Sure, we complain to ourselves when the daily paper cuts the home and garden section to one thin column or when our local PBS station cancels our favorite garden show, but Do we know that we are actually causing the demise of these worthy garden communication vehicles by our inaction? What you can do. First, subscribe to both print and online gardening publications and to other publications that contain garden-related content. Give gift subscriptions to everyone you know who may or shown a, a dot of gardening passion within them. Write letters to the editor letting them know you read the garden content and would like to see more of it. Be specific and effusive. Thank the advertisers that do support garden publications and let them know you appreciate their investment by purchasing their products and services. When you share a garden story via email or social media, never copy more than the headline and the first sentence or two, along with a link back to where it is originally published. Copying and pasting the entire story will not let the publishers and other decision makers know what is being read and passed along. They need to see the number of online views and clicks to the original article to measure its reach. Share links to gardening stories often on online social media, whether that be Facebook, Pinterest, LinkedIn, Twitter, etc. Hit like every time you read an online article or article or blog post comment on garden articles. Even if you read the article in the print version, go to the publication's website, blog, or Facebook page and let them know you read it. Your comment can be as simple as, keep up the good work. Get passionate. When a neighbor at the annual block party compliments your zinnias, offer to share seeds with them and then tell them about the latest garden book you are reading. If a youngster within your sphere of influence shows the least interest in plants, take them under your wing. At your workplace, share your garden's fresh bounty and tell people how they can grow their own. Don't accept the, I don't have a green thumb excuse. Veteran gardeners know that we've all killed many more plants on our way to gardening success than we care to admit. Share this article. Yes, you have my permission. 
in your garden club newsletters, community garden publications, public garden publications, master gardening group lists, etc. If you need a print version, just contact me at kathygents at gmail.com. What's new this week? Well, a lot more ice and snow in the garden keeping me indoors, but that's letting me access a lot of gardening webinars and I enjoyed the wonderful Greenscape Symposium that Kim Ironman was a part of uh, on Friday, February 19th, hosted by Brookside Gardens. Coming up will be the Rooting DC uh, several day virtual symposium, so extended from just one day in person to several days online. So I'm really looking forward to that. This week, I also attended a wonderful talk through the Four Seasons Garden Club on growing witch hazels. And I've added, of course, a few more to my wish list. And I am looking forward to a couple more garden clubs meetings this upcoming week, specifically Silver Spring Garden Club on moss gardening. And also the Beltsville Garden Club um, is having their meeting on February 24th. That's a Wednesday evening. And you can access their information at BeltsvilleGardenClub.org. Um, elsewhere in my gardening world, I'm forcing bulbs and branches into bloom. My forsythia have just opened up indoors, and that's adding a cheery note to these uh, dragging winter days. And I've also put out the February 2021 issue of Washington Gardener magazine featuring our garden photo contest winners. And we extended it this year from 17 winning photos to 21 because we had such a wonderful crop of entries and still had to leave out so many wonderful photos. But I encourage you to go to washingtongardener.blogspot.com and subscribe to the magazine and look at the current issue and flip through those wonderful photos they're also going to be on display this summer um, from August 1st through, through 30th at Meadowlark Botanical Gardens. And I encourage you to come and see them in person because they're even more stunning than they are um, online. And also included in this issue are some stories about comfrey, a new hardy begonia, House plants that thrive in low light, a wrap up of our virtual seed swap day, what to do in the garden this month, a plant profile on winter sweet, and Smithsonian's Botanical Illustrator is profiled. Um, one of my favorite articles that I think you should check out in this issue is the big changes for the University of Maryland's Big M in the traffic circle on Campus Drive. And that's my alma mater. I'm a journalism graduate from the University of Maryland. So this is a story that's near and dear to my heart. I'm so looking forward to the Purple Line coming to the campus and excited about the Big M being preserved and just moved a little bit to the left of the current M. So check that out and happy gardening. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter by going to anchor.fm backslash Kathy dash gents backslash support. For as little as 99 cents a month, you can become a listener supporter and we'll give you a shout out in a future episode. Another way to support Garden DC is to go to WashingtonGardener.com and subscribe to Washington Gardener magazine. You can find Washington Gardener online at WashingtonGardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine.